for joining us today for our virtual mind walk. My name is Carissa and I am a California State Park interpreter. And today we have a great presentation for you from Chad Jackson. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to go over a few things. The virtual mind walks are a lecture series hosted by California State Parks and the Central Coast State Park Association. And we host them twice a month on Fridays and they're free for everyone to attend. You can see the list of upcoming mind walks from the CSPA website. And the mind walk program is underwritten by E and Mary Catherine Elstroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Park Association. And today our presentation is gonna be about 40 minutes and we'll have some time at the end for some questions. To ask your presenter a question, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. There's a little icon. And if you click on this, then there will be a field where you can type your question. And you can ask questions at any point in the presentation, but we won't get to it until the presentation is over. And also today's presentation is recorded. So if you need to head out early or want to share this with someone else, it will be available to watch next week and sign up for CSPA's newsletter to receive the link to watch once it's uploaded. Okay, and that is all for housekeeping. Now let me introduce your speaker. Hello, everybody. Um, so this is Chad Jackson. Thank you for joining us again today. Yeah. Chad Jackson was born and raised in Cayucas and received his BS from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. He worked in cultural resources since 2005 and worked for Elise Wheeler from 2005 to 2008 and did private consulting from 2010 to 2018 and has since been the Slow Coast District Archaeologist from November 2018 to the present. His interests are conservation of cultural sites, indigenous culture, and modern revitalization. Okay, Chad, if you want to take it away. Alrighty, thank you. So yeah, I hope everybody's doing well today. I'm excited to give you a little presentation here on uh, sort of the Native American history here in San Luis Obispo County. And um, yeah, I guess most of you know um, that we have two tribes here in the county nowadays. Uh, we have the Northern Chumash and the Salinan tribes, and they are represented by lineal descendants of the survivors, I should say, of Mission San Luis Obispo de Tolosa, Mission San Antonio, and Mission San Miguel. And uh, nowadays, I work directly with these groups to help manage all the amazing archaeological sites we have, other cultural sites, and working with state parks, our biologists, the public, and the tribes to try to conserve um, these resources on these beautiful state park lands that we have. And bringing these stories to the public is part of what we do um, through the interpretive folks and um, through all of our specialists. And, uh, and also trying to incorporate uh, these descendant communities, the tribal people themselves, um, to help tell that story. So today I'm gonna give you just like an overview of the Native American history, um, particularly from an archeological perspective. It would be nice to bring in some, some folks from the Northern Chumash and Selene in, in the future, and they could, you know, perhaps um, we could team up and do something more about um, what they're doing nowadays, but I can mention some of that. But so let me get into the presentation here. So the story for 
California Indians here in San Luis Obispo County. It really begins in the late Pleistocene. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and we'll work our way back to the present. So during the late Pleistocene, as most of you probably are familiar with, it was the last glacial maximum. So during this last glaciation, um, the planet was much colder and the sea levels were much lower. And there's been a lot of interest in how people first came to America. Some of the tribal narratives speak of the people being here since the very beginning. And from an archeological perspective, we're looking for evidence. And there has been a tradition of this narrative of the Bering Strait land bridge and people following Pleistocene megafauna through the ice-free corridor that came through the center of the continent, basically dumping people out in the Midwest. And that's where it all started. Well, as more research has been conducted, they've come up with an alternative. There's been separate waves of migration into the Americas. And this coastal migration theory talks about people coming across the coast from Northeastern Asia. And these were the first people to come to America, according to the theory. And they followed essentially what's been called, hypothesized as this kelp highway. So they were following the coast on boats and I guess skirting the shoreline. Of course, they were also on land, but this region of the intertidal habitat provided such a substantial reliable resource base that if there were no resources on land they would have everything that they needed so in times when it was too snowed over too cold during the ice age they had everything they needed here in the in the these kelp forests which had fish shellfish marine mammals sea vegetables of course they still needed to get fresh water and everything else and they could supplement their their diet, their marine-based diet on, off of land resources. So as they followed um, this, essentially this kelp highway, they came into North America for the first time and they continued down, they got to Central California where we are. And there is some evidence that these people were here 13, 14,000 years ago. There are some sites in South America that date to 14,000 years ago. So more evidence will surface as time goes on, but um, this is a little simulation of the receding of the coastline as the sea levels rose. And you can see it makes sense that they could follow this. And you can see that the, the waters are somewhat protected too um, from storms and wave activity. Um, so the earliest evidence here in Central California for people begins in the Channel Islands, which many of you probably already are familiar with this, but back during the late Pleistocene, it was one giant island. And they found Arlington Springs women in the 1950s. In the late 90s, they dated it to 13,000 years ago, which was at the time pretty much the oldest remains in, in North America. Also in San Miguel Island, they've, the Daisy Cave is another site that dates to 10,500 years ago. Well, here in Slo, we have one of the oldest archeological um, sites as well. In the Atascadero area, we have the Cross Creek site, which was 10,300 years old. Um, so extremely old right here in our county. Also, there are many sites dating to around 9,000 years old. Montana de Oro, Cayucos, Cambria, Pismo. And um, during this time, oh, here's a little map. It shows uh, kind of some of these old sites in our county where they're located. Sorry for the graininess, but um, this came from a, a report from Terry Jones who um, reported on the Cross Creek discovery. There was also a fluted projectile point found in a Pomo, and those are dated to the same 10, 000, pre 10,000 years old. So here's a map of our coastline here for the slow coast. It doesn't really show the Pismo region, but if you look at the contours and that first line 
off of the coast would have been roughly where the coastline was around 10,000 years ago. And the next contour level out, I think it says 200 feet, would be around 12, 13,000 years ago. So you could just see the coast was way out. And the coastline was this long, gradual terrace. If you are familiar with the Stero Bluffs, those terraces, imagine that those terraces went out two miles or you know, at least a mile. And you had this really interesting landscape along the coast of this really flat, um, gradual, um, sloping terrace. And then at the water's edge, it had a much narrower um, offshore environment before it dipped down to real deep water. So um, this is a description of the archeological framework for the chronology of Central California. And this is based upon patterns that have been observed in the archeological record. And these patterns are distinguished from, each period is distinguished by different patterns. And it is corroborated, it's, it's been cross-referenced with climatic data from the past, paleoclimatic data, lots of different studies and other areas in California. This is particular to San Luis Obispo and it is similar to other areas of California, but this is particular for our area. We were in a, you know, this San Luis Obispo was somewhat isolated from the rest of the state because of these mountains. Um, you know, you have Big Sur to the north, uh, to the east, we have, you know, pretty big mountains. And considering that we had the main Chumash culture sphere in Santa Barbara County, and then we have the Central Valley, those areas were basically the people who stayed there. They didn't really go all the way into San Luis Obispo County and back very often. And it shows because there's differences in the cultural, physical remains of the cultures, um, at least going further back. So this, uh, these dating systems are based on radiocarbon years. And just a little um, sort of disclaimer at the bottom, you can read that, but uh, basically in the 1950s is when they came up with the carbon isotopy based system for carbon 14. And it's based on the zero point of 1950. So you wanna get up to present times, you basically add 71 years to all these dates. So um, this is really the framework that we work with when we look in the archeological record and we're dating sites or, okay, that landed in the middle period. So the earliest ar archeological evidence here in Slow, it really the archeological story for the San Luis Obispo begins about 10,000, 9,000 years ago. At this time, the sea levels were still lower. The coastline was still further out. And during this 5,000 year time period, during this milling stone period, a lot of those sites will have been flooded nowadays. So basically around 5,000 years ago, the sea level rose to its present level. Any sites that were um, along the coast edge are now underwater. And there could be some survival of those sites, but we know how rough this coastline is. Wave activity and sedimentation from creeks, you know, most of those sites are probably destroyed. So um, we have lots of sites in this area dating to the milling stone period. Um, Montana de Orca, I guess I, I kind of mentioned that. Um, but this is when the, the really the archeological story begins. And during this time, the people were surviving off of a lot of vegetable proteins. So we see that going back this far, they weren't eating acorns. They weren't hunting as much as they did later. They were harvesting these, there's vast grasslands. So the, the, the landscape was different. There was less oak trees, there's more grasses. And if you guys have seen the fiddle necks in the spring, the yellow, the amsinkias, those are high protein seeds. So they were harvesting those and they were harvesting the chia sage seeds. There's a big craze for uh, chia nowadays because it's, it's so high in protein. So that's what the people were eating primarily. And they were also uh, gathering abalone and mussel 
and not really eating the other shellfish that they did later. So they had those kind of uh, easy to get shellfish. And then once they've, once we transition out of the Millingstone period, climate changes, it gets a little warmer and drier and the oak woodlands expand in the state. So you have now all these oak woodlands and people started to eat acorns and they also started hunting more. So perhaps there were more deer, maybe, um, but you see in the in archeological record, way more projectile points and large spears for hunting and also the, the fallen remains that we find. And still eating a ton of abalones along the coast here in Slow. And it's hypothesized that these are the Northern Shumash and Hokan speakers that lived during this period along the San Luis Obispo coast. Prior to that, it's harder to say there's been population movements. So we're talking about long periods of time here, 3,000 years, a lot can happen. So um, populations really exploded during this time period. Um, along the Montana Oro coastline, here's, well, yeah, here's so bed, bull mortars and pestles are introduced because they're eating the acorns and they develop this technology, large spears, and they use them with as hand spears, thrusting spears. They also had the addle addle, which was uh, like a dog thrower stick, no bow and arrow yet. Um, and then I wanted to say that um, along Montana de Oro, they were heavily relying on seabirds. So they're hunting seabirds. I mean, there's just tons of seabirds and this flightless duck, which is in the, found in the archeological sites and it was hunted to extinction during this period. Um, they must've been pretty easy to get uh, roosting on the offshore rocks um, and they couldn't fly. So they were dead ducks. So they, uh, the, the Chindetes lawi is the scientific name for that. Now extinct bird. Now we move into the middle period, which is sort of when the origins of the modern tribe their culture is it emerges um, more population expansion throughout the state um, and down in the Shumash realm this is when the true Shumash culture becomes uh, it develops in the Santa Barbara region the cultural the social complexity is evident during this time period it becomes a very much more complex society, especially compared to any of the other regions around it. Um, the middle period sites, sites that are a thousand years to 2,500 years old, are really pretty widespread in this county and all along the central coast. Um, and so you start to see this Shumash influence. The beads that the Shumash made on the Channel Islands and, and elsewhere from the Olivella shells, are now found far from Shumash territory. Definitely found here in Slow. And um, here in Slow, interesting, they started hunting sea otters extensively. And as the populations expanded across the state, there became more regional interaction, more trade. Um, people couldn't just move into a new area because there were already people there. So they kind of had to find their niche. And as there's this trade network established between the Shumash and the central coast, north of the Santa Barbara area with these interior tribes, you had to have something to trade. So the coastal people had sea otter pelts. Imagine snuggling up on a sea otter pelt when you're in the middle of the snow. And so what did the mountain people have in exchange? They had obsidian. And so this trade network becomes pretty important, especially towards the end of this period. And another big thing happened in the Shumash area, and that is they invented the tamol, or you know, the tamol became introduced somehow towards the end. And the tamol was the plank canoe, which was capable of transporting tons of people and goods into rough seas, long trips. Um, and so in the Channel Islands, you just see much more 
inter-island travel, coming from the mainland back to the islands, trade amongst that whole area, offshore fishing becomes a major, a major thing. And you find pelagic fish in the archaeological record now, tuna, swordfish, all these, all these things appear um, as a result of this plank canoe technology. Um, and uh, let's see. Well, so here's some, these beads to the right here are the Olivella shell beads that were strung and used essentially for money. And we have different bead types that we find that are pinpointed to certain time periods. So without radiocarbon testing, without other direct dating techniques, you can use relative dating and find a bead that we have already, archeologists have already uh, pinpointed to certain ages. And so by finding these beads, it's one way to, to, to determine how the age of an archeological deposit. Um, so the tamol is represented here on the left. And now at the end of the middle period, major, major changes happen. Um, Oh, back up one second, I forgot about this slide. Here's the obsidian sources that we have on the central coast. And you can see how far some of these trade networks went. I mean, Medicine Lake is far, that's the east beyond Shasta, Mount Shasta, and it is present here. And Napa is closer, and those are uh, obsidian source to that, that's by the Clear Lake area. Casa Diablo, um, Mammoth region in the Coso, east of the Tehachapi and all that is the, most of the obsidian comes from those two sources. And that continues all the way till um, much later. But so that, those trade networks were in place 2,500 years ago and continued all the way up until when the contact occurred. Um, Selenian rock art in the Santa Lucia Mountains becomes uh, a lot of the rock art is dated to the middle period, the earliest rock art. Um, so you perhaps have some of the religions being developed in this time period too, 2000 years ago. And uh, then at the end of the middle age, middle period, the medieval climatic anomaly was a sustained period of drought in, in the Northern Hemisphere. 300 years of drought. Um, in California, closer to the coast, the drought was confined to a little shorter period, about 150 years. But we all know the impacts of drought on our water supply nowadays. Back then, similar, especially where we had, you know, very like societies that were living along the rivers of the Central Valley and these lakes. A lot of these places dried up. And so people started to move more to the coast. Um, populations, movements occurred. And this environmental stress basically was a catalyst for social change. And this is when the Shumash society really elevated to this stratified chiefdom, which was the highest level of cultural complexity ever seen in California. And this concentration of power, um, of accumulating resources and controlling who gets the resources and holding other regions, towns um, responsible for tribute, things like that, and, and even slavery. So also violence and warfare becomes much more evident. Okay, that's a strange view. The, um, and uh, because there's so many people in the interior that are in areas that dried up, they had to move on. You know, similar things happen in the Southwest where the Anasazi, other people, you know, they 
could no longer do what they were doing in the past because of these droughts. So as these different populations came towards the coast, they brought with them, we had cultural mixing. And so Salinan groups probably incorporated and brought in other tribes and learned different things. And when they did, they brought the bow and arrow. There was no bow and arrow before that in, in Central California along the coast. And so now we have um, bow and arrows and we have more violence. There's a very interesting site at Coon Creek where it's dated pretty much confined to this, this time period where we know the droughts were occurring and Coon Creek has a perennial stream there. So when all the other watersheds were dry, this one still had water. Um, you also had all the, the coastal resources. So if there was way less animals in the interior because it was dry, um, oak trees weren't producing as well, you still could depend upon these marine resources that really weren't affected. Um, we have the, to the right here, these uh, smaller projectile points are bow and arrow points. And prior to thousand years ago, there were no points of this type. They didn't have the bow. And then circular fish hooks in the Shumash area and here become introduced. So heavier, heavier reliance on fishing. They said, you know, less, less animals and land to depend on, more fish. And so fishing, be, fish become like the, they were always depending upon fishing as part of their diet, but fishing became much more important. You know, they, you know, when there's no other meat to be had, you know, they had to figure out a way to improve their fishing technology and they did. So, As we transitioned out of this, well, the middle late transition is what this period was called. Uh, and right around 1200 AD, the drought subsided and we get a climate similar to today. To today. Of course, we have cyclical droughts and stuff, but it wasn't so sustained. And so things were a little bit uh, alleviated um, and we now have these very complex societies in place. Violence is still a thing. There's territories are guarded. People are more sedentary. They're living in permanent areas. And this is when the Shumash culture peaked in its complexity. And we see it um, in some of the early European doc, uh, documentation in the archeological record. And it was, these are the cultures that we now identify with. Um, the Salinan people the, here in Slo and the Shumash people, Northern Shumash people, this late period, this is when these cultures um, carried through and to historic contact and even to today. And so this is really when we get into um, the modern tribal identities are associating with, with these patterns, this, these cultures, this heritage here. And, um, there's lots of literature on, on the Shumash religion and stuff like that. I'm not gonna get into it so much today, but um, it was very interesting. There was, um, like I said, this was the most complex society ever to occur in California. The Northwest cultures were similar. So if you get up into Humboldt and North of there, it was similar, but for a non-agricultural society, um, this chiefdom, level and this these are anthropologic terms sort of the chiefdom societies like varying levels of complexity so you have bands which is like nomadic hunter gatherers and you have tribes which are more organized and you have chiefdoms and uh, obviously big man cultures kind of thing they have like powerful chiefs that run the show um sure there was women very powerful women too during this time period and uh, they really um, commanded the, the rest of the, of the people around. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in a second, but um, there was one thing that is evident in the archeological record 
and through some of these early Spanish accounts, is that the complexity of the culture peaked. But what we see after about mid 1500s is that it went back down and places were abandoned for a while, maybe a hundred years. What we think is that the diseases that were already impacting native people in Mexico and other parts of the continent made its way across, even though there were no Europeans here, the diseases made it here. And stories of, you know, the white man and ships and all these things um, affected the cultures. And of course, we have these early Spanish accounts here along the coast, starting with Juan Cabrillo in 1542. Um, and these Spanish explorers made very brief visits. And so you can imagine they show up and then they're gone. And so the people are just sitting there left to just come up with all kinds of, you know, guesswork upon what's going to happen now. And uh, that really affected society. I mean, you could cause, you know, it could cause a crumbling of society just based on, you know, inner tribal uh, violence that could result from it. And also these diseases that made their way across the land from Mexico. And so um, some of these early Spanish accounts are very interesting. As I said, Gabriel was the first and he documented lots of people in, uh, along the central coast in Santa Barbara and in Avila. And this Pedro de Unamuno, it's somewhat controversial. Some people don't think that the, the record is really describing Morabe, but the records say that he arrived in Morabe in 1587 and came into contact, landed. And I've read through the, the, the description multiple times. So it basically says that he landed on the sand spit, came across, parked the boat, sent some, some people across, and they voyaged up Los Osos Valley and documented things like the very first sweat lodge ever documented, saw natives doing their thing and the natives weren't like oh well, what are these? they basically attacked them and they were attacked one of the spaniards was killed and so the spaniards retaliated with their guns and but they were scared they didn't use their superior firearm to go take over they went back retreated basically and uh and fled and they left and that was the documentation i think it was a two-day stint and then later on so Sir Manuel came through a couple years later, um, 1594 and 1595, and he documented people in Avila at San Luis Bay. And they apparently were, were yelling, was documented in the diary that they were yelling, Mexico, Mexico, Cristianos. And so even though Cabrillo came across, noted some people and left, Unamuno perhaps came, these people already knew what was going on because, you know, think about the gossip back then. I mean, it was coming all the way up from Mexico of what was happening. And so uh, we have then Sebastian Vizcaino and he came across and noted similar, similar descriptions of people on boats, very, um, but also some areas he visited, there was no people. So that's where, analyzing some of these documents, well, maybe they already started to, some impacts were already occurring with disease. And so 160 some odd years went by with no contact along this coast with Europeans. And so what happened in that interim? You can just imagine, um, obviously, you know, word on the street coming up across the landscape talked about, you know, they learned what was happening elsewhere. But uh, the, the beginning of the end was with Portola, 1769. Here's a, a couple of maps. You see just what these expeditions were coming through the area. Um, 
Um, so the first overland expedition by Portola in 1769, when they decided, finally, Spain decided they're gonna colonize California, Alta California. And they did their voyage for their, their overland expedition from San Diego to look for Monterey. They didn't find it the first time. They came back, they noted all these different native communities in the Central Coast, Chumash people, of course, in Santa Barbara, but also they noted along the Salinas River Valley, 20 towns from San Luis Obispo to Soledad, roughly. So the Salinan people were thriving and they finally, second time to try to find Monterey, they found it and they established their second presidio because they already had a fort in San Diego, established their presidio in Carmel. And then they came back and like, hey, we got to go back to where all those towns were and set up a mission. And so even though it's the third mission, technically in California, San Antonio de Padua, it was really the first mission established strictly for converting the Indians, it wasn't necessarily a you know strategic port like the other two were. And so they established Mission San Antonio in 1771. And uh, they started bringing people there and, and then they went and established Mission in Los Angeles next. Amongst the Gabrieleño and the very next year they came up and they, they came to slow. And they set it up right next to a village. And thence began the, the, the mission records, of course, telling us what was happening. But they started recruiting the people and bringing them in. And then San Miguel was established 27, five years later, as a middle point between uh, San Antonio and San Luis Obispo because it was really far. And there's a lot of people they just couldn't get to. A lot of people were still holding out and, and you know, they weren't coming to the mission. So they said, we need to set up another one. And um, so our mission records tell us a lot about this, the demographics. It's um, the baptismal records talk about the village you came from, the language you spoke, marriage ties. Let's see what I go into that. Okay. Um, and uh, and so a lot of what we know about you know what was what the landscape the cultural landscape you know where were the villages you know what what were the relationships between them it comes from these mission records and so a lot of a lot of changes occurred in a pretty short time period here we have uh, we have the. Um, we have the um, transfer of the missions to the new Mexican government with the Mexican Revolution in 1821. And it took a while. The missions still ran for a long time until the 1830s that they secularized the missions, secularization of the missions, meaning that they, they were no longer controlled by the government. They let these different landowners and branch basically turned them into ranches, essentially. So the all the mission lands became now you know part of this new mexico that's bringing in settlers that's started industry cattle industry and a lot of the people that lived on the mission started working on these ranches so the salinans and the northern shumash people basically became indentured servants you know some of them probably had you know some other liberties but but the mexican government and the mexican ranchers you know, they they ran uh, an industrial sort of enterprise of farming and having a lot of animals and trying to create this new society. So that it didn't last very long. Then here comes America and they, they took it over. 1846, they started um, taking it all over and bringing in Americans. Then you really hit a time period when it was really bad for the Northern Shumash and the Salinians. They were treated very poorly, worse than the Mexicans and the Spaniards in some cases. And so 
there was this disruption of what had happened before. And so the dispersal of people, luckily, some of them stayed in the county and uh, they made it into some of the, made it onto some of the ranches that were then, people were then able to, the ones that had retained knowledge from the old days were able to then tell these early ethnographers about their cultures. Because that time period after the missionaries, nothing was really recorded. And so the first ethnographers that became interested in recording these cultures began here on this list of these ethnographers. And this is where so this is a plethora of information about about the cultures of the Selene and the Northern Chumash, as long as many other California Indian groups. But if it wasn't for this critical work, so much would have been lost because the passing down of a lot of this knowledge along their, through their families was very difficult to retain. So the work originated with Alexander Taylor, um, who wrote down a lot of a lot of information about the uh, village names and the village locations and the language. And H.W. Henshaw in the 1880s, he spent time in San Luis Obispo with both Northern Chumash and Salinan survivors and did a lot of work for language, which then contributed to John Wesley Powell's book, um, Linguistic Families of North America, North of Mexico in 1891. And that described I have a map here, describe these language families um, that were then looked at and sort of refined. But then you have Seahart Merriam, 1902. He did a lot of work. He, li he lived with the people. And so the Selenian consultants for these ethnographers, there was several of them. They knew all about the old ways. They had retained it and we're able to pass that knowledge on. And we have some of these informants, Salinans and Shumash, Rafael Solares here. J.P. Harrington was a very famous ethnographer. Um, who, Fernando Librado here on the left, he was, he's the one who basically told J.P. Harrington all the information that he then used to write books about the Shumash religion. Of course, some of that information was also passed down through the lineages. And so we also have to honor those, the information that modern day descendants also have to share. But this, this ethnography work was really important. And we had Rosario Cooper, who was the last Northern Chumash speaker, was an informant for J.P. Harrington. And a lot of what the tribes have done now is they've been able to listen to her recordings, the Smithsonian, and revitalize their language. And here's some Selene Indians here at Via Creek in Cayucos. They had a ranch that many Selenians moved to. And here's a list of of village names. I'll leave that up for a second. And these were recorded. Some of the spellings are the different spellings for different, um, different ways to spell them, but these came from <clears throat> just one of the several sources. Um, this is mainly from originally recorded in the mission records. They would write down the village that the people came from. And it wasn't very descriptive, it'd be like 20 miles. 20 miles west or two and a half leagues west of the Mission San Luis Obispo along the creek. And then so you, some guesswork is involved. But then later, these ethnographers, one in particular trip, J.P. Harrington traveled with a few of the Salinans down the Toro Creek and all the way up to San Simeon. Along the way, his informants told him what the place names were called. And so he wrote all that stuff down and then later cross, later cross referenced it. Oh, that was the same name for this, the village in Cambria or in Cayucos. Um, and here's another map here shows sort of a bunch of different village names, lots of question marks next to the, the names there. But this is some of the work that I'm doing now is to try to you know look at some of the archeological sites, see if we can find new data and confirm that, oh, wow, this site is you know the village of such and such. And so that's something that, that archeologists now are dive into, it's difficult work, but it's really interesting. Um, here's another 
map showing some of these places. Showed Cagua is pretty recorded multiple times as being right there at Morro Creek, just north of the rock. Um, Sepato is Avila, and that was a major, major spot. Um, here's some of the stuff along the Salinas area, some of the village names. You can see these were also coming from that ethnography work where they traveled around with those Salinan people and had them tell them exactly where the village was, what the name was. And pretty amazing work to do this and, and feel confident that you now know where that village was because it was really difficult before. It was just guesswork, like I was saying. So um, the languages are super important. And I try not to drag this on too much, but the languages, um, Chumash and language families are the oldest languages in the entire state, if not the oldest. There's been DNA research with Chumash people that has confirmed that these, this DNA sequence was originally found across the West Coast all the way from the, to the South America and really pinpoints a, a bloodline that goes all the way back to the first peopling of the Americas. Really, it's pretty, pretty well established now that the Chumash languages originated from these early, early peoples. The Northern Chumash language is its own language that diverged from Northern, from the regular, other, sorry, not regular, but the, uh, the other groups of Chumash families up to 9,000 years ago. So that just state shows that these people were isolated from the other Chumash people and they developed their own culture and their own language that diverged. And even the early ethnographers said, this is a different language altogether. It was later found that it was related, but so much different that it was its own isolated group. Um, Shumash comes from originally from these ethnographers. They tried to lump everybody into one category. So they called them Shumash when really Mishumash or Alchum were terms from Santa Rosa Island. And uh, it later just became too, a uh, descriptive word for all the people who spoke these Shumash languages. Here's some modern day descendants. To the left is Leyla and Olivas Odom, who passed away just a year ago, but um, she was one of the primary Northern Chumash people in San Luis Obispo County who did so much work to help preserve sites and work with her culture. And now her sister, Ona Tucker, is sort of the chairperson for the tribe. Um, so Selena language is also very interesting. It developed out of a Southern Hokan language family and also diverged around 9,000 years ago. So it also developed here in the northern, uh, southern Monterey, northern San Luis Obispo County. And so these people were also here for a really long time and isolated from the rest and, and kind of took their own trajectory. Um, and there was a lot of ethnographic work to record the language, the Salina language. So that's, it was, it's very, the tribe now has a lot of resources to, to find their, their language. I have a, uh, I was gonna try to do, there's time. I know we're sort of want to leave a little bit of time here for questions, but um, let me try to do something real quick. If you guys hey there, hey, how's it going? Good. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. And we have about 10 minutes left. We can go through some questions, but chat if you need to leave right at two. No, I don't. No, I just okay. wanted to make sure everybody's still hanging in there. I kind of took that a little further than I wanted to. I wanted to have a few other things to show you, but let's do some questions. And if there's still time, I can, I can present some of these other things I wanted to show. Great. We just have a couple of questions in the chat. <laughs> Um, the first one is, are they known as tribes or nations? So I think referring to the Chumash and other tribes that you discussed. They, everybody has their own way of describing their group, but uh, a nation isn't really the term used, especially because Chumash is a collective term talking about many different autonomous groups. So you would have the San Ynez Chumash tribe, the Yachichichichu Northern Chumash tribe, um, if you somebody says Chumash Nation, they're probably trying to bring all the Chumash tribes into one umbrella, which, you know, maybe maybe be a good thing for them to do because you might have more sway to protect sites and 
um, get more federally recogn recognition from the government. But essentially, they were separate groups. They refer to themselves as tribes. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question is that someone was wondering, they thought that tamales were used around Santa Barbara and the islands, but around Pismo, reed boats were used? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and there's been early records cited. People tried to say that there was plank, there was tamales being used here in this county, but there really has been no evidence for that. Tule uh, rafts were widely used. Um, I think I had a picture of one that I didn't quite get to, but yeah, Salinans and Northern Chumash used the Tule reed, reed boats, and which were probably used all the way back 10,000 years ago. They're probably using those same boat technology. Great. Um, another one is, what was the border between the Chumash and the Salinan people? What was their relationship, friendly or competitive? So again, Chumash is referring to a very large language family. And so Northern Chumash is referring to the people who lived in San Luis Obispo that spoke the Northern Chumash language. Um, they did have relations with the Southern Chumash folks, but they were their own group. And so the boundary between the Northern Chumash and the Salinans, it's controversial because modern day groups want to have territories so that they you know, can do different things. But really the Morro Bay area looks to be most probable the real transition zone. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a hard line. And you're talking about at the time of historic contact, because when you're looking at 10,000 years of, of life, you, you know, here, what, you know, there wasn't always this def definitive boundary, but during that time of the missionaries and the early, early Sp Spaniards, they talked about this area from Morro Bay, basically to San Simeon being this mystery zone where this Playano language was spoken. Some people have tried to say it was Chumash language, some people, or Northern Chumash language. Other people try to say it's a Salinian language. There's been a lot of research done into it. It pretty firmly shows it was a, a Salinian language, but it's more of like a hybridized language where they had Northern Chumash and Salinian influence. So everything wasn't so cut and dry. And um, they also talk about, the Salinians obviously talk about Moro rock in their mythology. So it's very clear that they came to Moro Bay and that could have been sort of being such a big landmark. That could have been really the cutoff point. But if you ask the tribes, they'll tell you different. So tough question. I'm sure everybody asks me that too. Great, thank you yeah. for that. I will just say at State Parks, we have to recognize both tribes as being the, as San Luis Obispo County being their ancestral homeland. So we don't draw a boundary line either mm -hmm. for State Parks. We basically say Slow County, Salinan and Northern Chumash and leave it at that. Great, thank you so much. Um, one more, I think you kind of touched on this, but just the Salinan language, how is it related to Salinas Valley? So um, the name mainly is what that question Yeah, yeah it was another, another term that was created by, um, you know, first Spaniards and then later Americans to describe, you know, people collectively, whereas within the Salinan language area, you had all these different autonomous groups that they didn't even necessarily communicate with one another, you know, all across that whole landscape. So they did all speak Salinan languages. The term Salinas comes from, you know, salt, place of salt. So at Soledad is pretty much the cutoff for the Salinan language. So everything north of Soledad was different Costa and Ohlone speakers. So the city of Salinas is far from Salinan territory. But San Antonio River was where they put that first mission. That was sort of like the big heartland of the northern Salinan groups. They spoke the Antoniano language. And then kind of going off that question, how many language families are in California? Do you know? California was essentially the most linguistically diverse place on the planet. Papua New Guinea was similar, if not maybe maybe more languages there, but it's a crossroads from, from cultures. So 
you know, some people say 80, some people say 100. It kind of depends on where you draw those lines because within the Shumash language family, there's eight languages at least. So are you going to count eight for, the, you know, so depending on if, if you're going to be on either extreme, there's like over 100 languages spoken in the state. Many of them completely, un completely unrelated, different language families, population movements. We have languages here that are related to pe the people who live in the northeast of, of the country, relationships to groups in Mexico. And then some of these really old languages like Shumashan language family that started here and they're isolated from the rest of the world. So very interesting language stuff is super interesting. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then also someone is wondering if it's possible to visit the X Creek site in Atascadero. No, it's that site is not, there's nothing there. It was part of a project and it was found buried. So a lot of these archeological sites are very discreet deposits and there's nothing to see. I mean, a lot of them are reburied afterwards to protect. Um, and so there's, and I, I, and also, it's also confidential. A lot of the archeological sites, luckily here at state parks, we have protected land. So you can go visit some of these places. And part of my job and working with the tribes is to try to keep the disturbance to a minimum when you have people walking and checking out the archeology. span um, I do encourage checking stuff out for sure. Um, but a lot of those really, really old deposits are deep. So, you know, they've been buried by sediments over thousands of years. So you can't even see the part that's say 9,000 years old, but it's, it's down there somewhere. Great. Um, and one more question came in, are the cultural events open to public? So I think that's referring to the Northern Chumash and Selena people. Yeah. Well, sometimes like they've done stuff in more rock and that's sort of out in the open. And um, there's the powwow down there in Santa Inez. So it depends. The ones that are public will be advertised and you'll see them, but they definitely also have their own private stuff that they do. But anything that, that you see either on the, um, you know, advertised or it's right there out in the public at a public place, then it's most likely, you know, viewable, always be respectful because even sometimes that um, when we have these events, um, you get a lot of people that are a little bit invasive. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure most people know, you know, the boundaries of, of trying to be respectful and not, um, but it's really cool to see. I really enjoy seeing Native American culture here and seeing people descending communities able to practice and honor their traditions and still do things. And I think it's important for the public to see that and not have it be behind closed doors because it's part of this whole narrative is like retelling the story of California and having these native people be here, be visible. Great. Thank you so much, Chad. We got some good comments thanking you as well. Um, and thank you everyone else for joining us on this virtual mind walk. And then for all the attendees, when you exit the webinar, there's going to be that short survey that appears on the screen. screen. It's not required, but it'd be extremely helpful for us to get your feedback about this. We appreciate your time and everybody have a great weekend. Chad, is there anything else that you wanted to say to the group? No, thanks for thanks for joining in. Yeah, I, I had some other stuff I wanted to, to bring out, but I think I got to carry it away on some of my, my other stuff. So, well, I guess we'll wait till next time. All right, great. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Okay.